We're proud to have as our keynote this morning a gentleman that uh, was with us last year. Uh, he just put on a, a great conference in, in uh, his home state of the USAT conference. Uh, a lot of people went to that, so I heard great things about it. I just couldn't get to it. I wish I had. But uh, it's my pleasure to bring up the CEO of USAT, everybody, Rob Erbach. Good morning. All right, all set. Everybody's uh, hopefully will soon be awake. So, get my. All right, I'm going to talk today a bit about the current status, a bit of the state of the union, and the future of triathlon. With hopefully the perspective that we're all here to uh, do this together to grow the overall market. But the first question I get asked a lot, you know, is do I have any triathlon credential? We have a lot of people in this room at this conference that have been around this sport for a long, long time. Well, actually, I actually produced my first race uh, in 1984. This is at my college, and if you can see on there that you know, back then, you know, helmets were only merely encouraged. So I think our safety standards have evolved tremendously since then. And since in, I had a career in sports, I started uh, in the sports business uh, with Richard Adler, the pro serve back in uh, 1991, and had a lot of experience with a lot of events, everything from pro tennis and golf to uh, to professional bull riders. So I'm hoping that the Tripronos, I don't know if anyone you're in the room right now. Uh, I don't know, if, I think I saw Dan out in the hallway. I don't know if Bob's in the room, but uh, hopefully uh, I have enough credibility with this group. Second question is what got me started? And like many people here, you know, there was a famous Sports Illustrated article in 1979. And this is something that really resonated with me. I didn't know any triathletes, didn't know anything about the sport, really wasn't much of a swim runner or biker, but for some reason I was drawn to this event. And then in 1982, I was, found myself in Kona with, uh, with Kathleen and, and, and Julie Moss, who everyone saw last night, and although this was the October race, they were in the May race, it was certainly the same year, but you see our nutrition has certainly evolved substantially since then as well. And then, you know, back, certainly the bike industry is also involved, because that was back in the day. Now, the last question is, what gets me excited about USA Triathlon? And, and there are a lot of things, and you know, certainly not about me. Uh, you know, I, we, I work, uh, we work for a lot of people, our 500,000 members, and several hundred race directors, and coaches, and volunteers, and so there's a, there's a lot of very engaged, passionate people. But for me, it's very important um, in the office to have the notion that we're here to, to service. And we do that through a mantra of sharing the win. And the win is very broadly defined. It's much more than wins on the podium. It's allowing everybody to reach their full potential through our sport, to overcoming you know, substance abuse through a platform of triathlon, for our sponsors to, to have a competitive edge in driving transactions. And this is what we live every day in the office, and you can see that as you, as you ever come to Colorado Springs. Um, also kids, you know, I think this is clear. I'm gonna talk about this in more detail. The future is very important. This is from a second grade classroom that I spoke to, one of my favorite days, and you know, every kid, how do I do a triathlon? And well, first gotta ask your parents, and then and we'll work on that. And I wanna start with a, wake everybody up a little bit more. This is sort of an embodiment of, of what our sport is about. Look, look, if you, if had, you had one shot, one shot, one opportunity, one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, everything you ever wanted, one moment, one moment, one moment. Would you capture, you capture, 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 or just let it just slip, let it slip. <laughs> Faster on the swim. Swim. Faster on the bike. Bike. Faster on the run. Run. Swim. Bike. Run. Faster on the swim. Swim. Faster on the bike. Bike. Faster on the run. Run. Swim. Bike. Run. Faster on the swim. Swim. Faster on the bike. Bike. Faster on the run. Run. Swim. Bike. Run. Faster on the swim. Swim. Faster on the bike. Bike. Faster on the run. Run. Swim. Bike. Run. Faster on the swim. Swim. Faster on the bike. Bike. Faster on the run. Run.
what a treat for a huge crowd in London's famous Hyde Park. A thrilling race and the closest triathlon in Olympic history. Thousands of one second would split the gold and silver medalists, with the bronze medalist just two seconds further back. I think Jack mentioned that the race in London, and for those of you who haven't seen that footage, that was a quite a phenomenal finish. What you don't see there is also that Sarah Groff was maybe 250 meters or so back the pace and just turned herself completely inside and out to, to close the gap, but just uh, got beat there in the sprint. And also the Manny Hirta footage and the photo that won last night, if you don't know the whole story there, what Manny's doing, he's counting in transition because he has to finish in top nine to uh, qualify for the Olympics, and sure enough, he's ninth, and then that's when the emotion breaks out. So those were uh, some quiet moments. Hope everybody now is fully awake. Okay, I'm gonna talk a bit about the state of the sport with a quick overview. Um, I like to frame things and you know, where have we been, you know, where are we now in the sport, and then where are we going, and if so, how do we get there? And to start of our evolution of the sport, you know, in the beginning, it was, this fringe sport, is it going to last? Some of you were already engaged in the industry there. And then we went through a period where it developed and grew. And in, from 2000 to roughly 2009 or 10, there was double digit at least growth. And the sport was growing about 15% a year. And now, you know, we'll talk about growth in a bit here, but it's more important now that we have to professionalize, institutionalize the sport, that we increase our standards and drive value to all our constituencies. So what business, what do we do at USA Triathlon? I think that even triathletes don't know exactly you know, what we do. We're, I think we're in three businesses. First, we're in the governance business. Somebody has to sanction and make all the rules and make it safe and, and standardize the sport. Um, we're uh, also, you know, we conduct as the governing body, you know, we're obligated to conduct national championships. Uh, we're in the service business and, and I say that you know, to our staff, you know, we're here to serve a broad constituency. You know, USA Triathlon has a couple hundred volunteers, 21 committees, 500,000 members, a pretty engaged board, and, you know, we work for all these people, and I think the platform just happens to be triathlon. And the third business is we're in the Olympic business. So, and that's twofold. We're in the business of developing Olympians, and equally as important, we're in the business of making everyone else feel like an Olympian. I think it's really important for race directors, sponsors, retailers, partners. You know, our members are so passionate. It's often their identity, their lifestyle, and they all really want to have the same feeling. So what do we do? Okay. Well, you know, we obviously sanction events. You know, we're going to talk later. I think Catherine Teak is on the uh, risk panel here shortly. It's a big part of what we do to keep this industry afloat. Um, we certify coaches, officials, race directors. Uh, we try to give as much support as we can to our members, and I'll talk more and more about that. Uh, we have retailer programs. We have a foundation. Um, so how are we doing? Well, I look, view our current reality here. Our strengths really is our membership. As a governing body, you know, there are probably organizations that have more members. You know, there are, say, swimming or, or volleyball or maybe gymnastics, but these are mostly kids. And our membership, as we'll see demographically, is pretty robust pretty hard to beat. Um, our weaknesses is, you know, we don't have a lot of diversity in our membership. We certainly don't have many spectators, and growth has naturally decelerated from what it once was. Uh, opportunities, new offering, we're trying to understand what drives our members, what drives people to be in our sport, and we're engaging much more deeply with that membership. The threats, you know, there's, there's obviously the competitive offerings that are out there. Uh, I think we've actually survived the economic headwinds pretty well. Uh, and the largest threat is, in, in my view, the entire industry is risk. And if there's ever any catastrophic payouts, the whole industry will suffer. So take some details. Membership, which is, this is, I think, the most important barometer of the health of our industry. And if you look at the growth I talked about earlier, great growth, a bit of a flattening. And while the jury's still out, I think we've jump-started growth here. I think some of the programs that we're doing to retain our membership and encourage people to race more and engage more in our sport are starting to be effective. 
So our adult annual membership is at an all-time high. That's 113,000, 114,000, um, up almost, uh, you know, up 9.4%, which there's not many industries that are growing. You know, certainly in sports, participatory, discretionary funding industries are growing at this level that are reasonably mature. Um, youth participation growing even more, double of adult. At 18.4%, we have 51,000 youth members. The total all-time high, 164,000. This does not include one-day members, which you add another 350,000 in one-day members. So we're well over 500,000 in total membership. Sanctioned events, uh, almost a 500 race growth. So now, I know several of you race directors out there feel, gee, there's too many races, and some numbers are down. Well, that's probably true. But in terms of our, our membership, providing them with choice and convenience, the ability to race long, short, race any weekend, you know, ideally, if you're a member, you want to be able to have a drive time race you know, every weekend in the summer. But I understand that for race directors, they feel that's problematic. So ultimately, we believe the cream will rise to the crop, and we're working through uh, some opportunities with race directors to take advantage of this growth. I think clubs is a real big barometer because many people come into the sport through the social fabric of their tri-club. They meet someone for a happy hour, next thing they know they find themselves on, on a track workout on a Tuesday night, and next thing you know they, somehow they find themselves in a race and all of a sudden their, their life and their, their social network is through their triathlon club. Some of the key challenges, you know, I've talked about this even a bit last year, you know, where, where are the fans? You know, I think we have a danger because we're all triathletes or are involved, invest in the sport, of being a little myopic. So how do we draw the casual fan in? You know, we are the opposite of mainstream sports. You know, we have very few, they have lots of spectators. So if there's 300 players in the NBA and maybe 1,000 in the NFL and, and you know, very few professional team sport athletes, but lots and lots of spectators in all mainstream sports that have significant media and sponsorship look this way. We are the opposite. You know, lots of participants, uh, very few relative spectators to mainstream sport. And, you know, if you're a non-triathlete, you know, sometimes racing isn't necessarily that compelling to watch or to watch on television. We need to get here. And to be successful, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but we are striving for this moment. Wow, unbelievable cycling. I love that bike. Incredible. Wow. Oh, what's going on, Megan? Stroke. Stroke. Yes. Keep doing it. Yes, we're getting close. Swim exit almost there. Hey, babe. Hey, babe. Are you, are you ready to take me to dinner? Yeah, we're going to have to do it later. I'm watching this very, very important triathlon. Oh, it's going to have to be later. Come on. You Let's go. You were going to take me to nine. Well, it's going to have to be late. Make sure it has a late night menu. Let's go. Come on. Maybe just bring me a bucket of goo, please. Fine. Unbelievable finish. There we go. All right, here's a little snack. But just for a minute, okay? Uh, I really want to You know what? Me. You're in the way. I'm watching I'm watching this huge finish. No! Whoa. It's the worst mount I've ever seen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's just a triathlon. It's not just a triathlon. This is the Green Goblin Triathlon. Oh, come on, babe. That's what you said last night. Well. Last night was the triathlon. Well, it's this is the triathlon today, so we're just going to watch this. It's just a triathlon. There we go. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, that was tough last night. Real intense. I didn't even change clothes. At least I smell terrific. Now it's time to check some fantasy try. Hunter, you cost me 20 points this week. Are you kidding me? I lost to Rob. Great. Oh, brother. So, we're not there yet, but you, you know, certainly uh, we got a ways to go, but we're trying to do some initiatives to really draw some a little more fandom to the sport. Uh, before then, we're going to deal with uh, uh, some of the other issues. And clearly, you know, we're seeing the competition in uh, the industry. And I know it was talked about a bit yesterday, the success of, uh, of the dirty runs and mud runs. Uh, more remarkable, in my view, the success of uh, color runs. Maybe some of you have been involved with this. 
And the difference between the mud runs and, and the color runs is the sociality of it. These are groups of people that are going. You know, triathletes will go by themselves or with one friend or two friends, but these are big, big groups and they're drawn to the sport through their social media and social networks. And we have a couple of initiatives that are trying to capitalize on this wave. It's a bit of a younger demographic than we average, but clearly there's something here. Now, I mentioned slower membership growth, but I may need to take this slide out because you see that jump last year, and so far, you know, I'm watching this, this number almost daily. I think our membership is starting to grow, and why th this is the most important parameter I'll talk more about, but if your average member is racing you know, three, three and a half times a year, memberships, they're more vested. Okay, where are we going? Uh, we revised our strategic plan. The USA Triathlon had a plan that was intended to run through, uh, run through last year. We actually revised a little bit early and made some important modification. Uh, this was our mission, which is to, to encourage, support, enhance the multi-sport experience in the United States. And, you know, a subtle issue here is multi-sport didn't have enough definitive meaning to it. You know, we did it mean canoeing, what did it, hot dog eating and swimming. We didn't, there really wasn't enough broader identity. Where triathlon, not to ignore the broader community of duathlon, aquabike, aquathlon, really had more core meaning. So we just sharpened this to, to very simple to grow and inspire the triathlon community. Community is broadly defined in all forms of the derivative racing. Now, this is a very difficult vision that we had. The vision was to engage every American in the multi-sport lifestyle. I got a lot of stand up work pretty hard, but I, I can't engage 350 million people. So we refined this a bit to sim very simple and brought it back to, I think, a more tangible focus for all of our stakeholders to engage on. And it's pretty simple. It's to allow everyone in the triathlon community to reach their full potential, whether it's an athlete, a sponsor, a race director, a coach, an official, and you know, this is also pretty lofty because if we actually achieve this, I think we'll be enormously successful. Goals, you look at goals in terms of three buckets. The first is, is revenue and resources. The second is the value that we're providing to the industry. And the third piece here is how are we doing performance wise. Goals, first is membership. And the reason why membership is so important to the entire industry is the more members we have, I can't quite read that, move over this way. You know, the more members we have, members race more, they become vested more. They certainly want to do things, they want to go out, they want to hire a coach. They're, they're involved in camps and clinics and you know, more trisumers out there who are going to buy more products, more profits for the industry, et cetera more sponsors, which is important. The more numbers we can have, the more ability to engage the non-endemic sponsors. Then so on. This is our virtuous cycle. And this is really why we think membership is the key barometer for the entire industry. To grow membership, what else? We're going to certainly um, broaden our reach. We uh, are not diverse. We clearly need to put something together in programs that are scalable to engage minority communities where triathlon, frankly, is not really part of the culture. Um, we look at also our regions as another barometer. There's 10 USA Triathlon regions. This is essentially members per 100,000. And you can see how Florida is two and a half times almost the Pacific Northwest. So at least we know where the growth is for our industry by geography. We want to expand our event offering, which is really important because we have a lot of folks we know that you know, leave our sport because they get injured primarily running. And they can still be competitive. They can still identify themselves almost as a triathlete. This happened to be an aqua bike. So we looked into double our aqua bike races. Uh, duathlon is growing. It's still there. There's a new duathlon series this summer. Um, it's pretty mature. We don't think as much growth is there. Uh, aquathlon, we think there is also growth, which is folks that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, do not want to cycle anymore. Still provide them to be part of our community, more opportunities. Uh, our, our media continues to grow. Um, you know, I think this is important for us to be positioned as the governing body, as a thought leader. Uh, we have uh, tried to do as much as we can to spur the market through leveraging our website, doing more and more race webcasting to allow folks, you know, for example, the national championships has folks from all 50 states, 
and we do a pretty good webcast there, let friends and family and sponsors see that telecast back home. Youth. Um, we certainly youth participation, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, we're looking for various partnerships in the youth field. Um, accessibility of triathlon. We know from our research that people also don't enter or lead the sport because they view it's too expensive or it takes too much time or it's, it's too complicated. Uh, so we are trying to reduce all those barriers. A lot of people are from, frankly just intimidated. You know, they don't want to spend a couple hours race, running around their bathing suit. Um, uh, obviously, you know, it takes a certain economic commitment as well. So one thing we're launching out this summer in an effort to draw people into the sport that wouldn't ordinarily consider is a new series called a retro series that lowers the barrier, that is non-chip time, that is, um, we have dispensations for rules here. You know, there's a pacing rule where you can't do a triathlon with your friends. And we've abolished the pacing rule for this series so that, let's say, a, you know, these are short races, either super sprints or sprints. And let's say a 70-year-old you know, uh, grandfather want to do it with his 11-year-old grandson, and they want to do the race together. And so we're allowing, testing this this summer, our coach can go do a race with their client and talk them through the transition. And remember back to the color runs, how social that is. So now we can have groups of people that can come in and effectively you know, have that same engagement experience. And we'll see how it works. You know, we don't know, we're gonna try 10 races and then if it happens, uh, this could be the lower end of the market. These are our 10 sites. Um, school partnerships. You know, in New Zealand, every kid does a triathlon. It's part of their institution and their school system. Uh, we got a long way to go. It's not easy to access schools, but we have various entry points we're working through. Uh, we're also designing programming. And the key is, you know, there are some successes. I know that Rob Bigarito's program in Howard County, Maryland is terrific. And we're trying to model and emulate certain programs in school districts around the country. Hopefully that if we can get the necessary investment, it's complicated. Obviously, swimming and biking is a little complicated to do in a school environment, uh, but I hope that we can find programs that may be uh, more scalable, maybe we're leveraging duathlon, aquathlon as gateways, as pathway to triathlon. We fund youth teams. Um, there's 25 uh, youth teams uh, that we fund, which uh, I see this number will be growing. I have a plan to grow that to 40 teams. Uh, we, we provide them with four-year grants to hopefully they'll be sustainable over four years. They both have a sort of a high performance as well as an entry point community. I think it's really important. You know, the notion uh, about youth is that you know, right now, you know, kids are going to go to soccer practice on Tuesday and are going to go to you know, basketball practice on Thursday. And we need to be able to let them go to triathlon practice on Wednesday. And that creates an infrastructure of coaches and parents and a little bit of a cultural shift of having a team orientation to the youth programs. Retention. Um, we look to try to package as much insights into retaining members. And I think this is also a real key barometer and a number that I'm intensely focused on. Are we doing a good job with our customers in the industry? Are we keeping them in the sport? Do we keep them engaged enough to want to keep racing and racing? You know, some people do something else. They decide, you know, I'm going to go play golf next year and not race triathlons. And we want to keep those folks in the sport as much as we can. Uh, we have a, we did a research study in the first quarter of last year and looking at reasons as why folks didn't retain their membership. And a quick background on this study is, you know, we think our retention rate is in the high 50%. And, you know, it's hard to say if that's, you know, it's greater than the AARP, which is 48%, but much lower than the American Automobile Association, which is 88%. So we're probably you know, somewhere in, in the middle, and I want to try to find ways, you know, how do we improve that? But we really didn't know why members weren't renewing. We don't know why they lapsed. So we did a fairly comprehensive survey last year. We sent out emails to, to our members that did not retain. We had a fair number of good open rates, and we had this 1,700 plus submissions. And I'll, I'll highlight some of the data demographically here that I think is important. Uh, 
Uh, now this also, you could make the extrapolation, this also mirrors our overall membership. But in this group, it was 38% female. Um, average age, 41. Um, no secret here, we're, not, we're, we're certainly not diverse if we're 88% uh, white and, and minority groups are underrepresented. 65% uh, married, and this is a remarkable one. If you look at the post-college, you add the 44 for a college and the 29 for master's degree and doctoral degrees, a quick math, I think we're about 74% or so, you know, college and above. So triathletes are pretty smart, at least they spend a lot of time in school. Um, and even more impressive is the demographic, and I think we saw, Jack, I think on your slide, it was a, an average income of about $126,000. If you just look at the percentage that are over six figures, it's the majority. And there's not many uh, groups of national governing bodies, you know, maybe golf, maybe tennis, maybe equestrian, uh, maybe sailing, but we don't have the same group of active adults uh, in our database that we're working to leverage out to all the industry and certainly to our sponsors. Participation, you know, 72% characterize themselves as active participants. Uh, slightly more than half are doing more events. The average in 2012 was slightly over three events per member. And then the last one's pretty important because most folks are at least jumping in a sprint. And we're certainly seeing a lot of growth in the short distance category whether that's newbies, whether that's they just want to get a good training session in that day, but we're seeing uh, certainly substantial growth in the shorter distances. Uh, internet sites, uh, you know, active is uh, active in Ironman or, or uh, and USA Triathlon are, are certainly three of the, of the dominant inter internet sites in the sport. No secret here, our members are spending a lot of time on social networks, certainly. Uh, certainly on Facebook and Twitter. You know, that 19% is probably the, you know, the fact we have a pretty mature database. So we still have some analog members who actually send an application you know, via the mail for the membership, but it's fewer and fewer. Um, now the reason why they don't continue, you know, uh, there, there's uh, five points up here, I'll distill that to three. Because the expense, are they purchased the one day, and work and commitment, family commitment, we'll call that time. And the last one is injury. So the first two is you know, really an expense, economic issue, a time in issue, and an injury. And so what, what does this mean? So what are we gonna do about it as an industry? Well, you know, certainly on the expense side, you know, we think that you know, it's great as they migrate up the chain and want more bling and want to go to skip shop and, and buy uh, the latest, uh, you know, uh, zip disk wheel and, and, and invest, that's fantastic, but we don't want to intimidate them and say that's what they need to get started or that's what they need to really have it reach their potential in the sport. So it's important that we educate. Also, we think that our sponsor discounts through our partners are pretty substantial, and I would stack them up against any other national governing body in sports. Um, injury, you know, it's a tough one. You know, we're pretty sure that People generally get injured by doing too much and overtraining and pushing it too hard. I mean, anecdotally, how many stories do you hear? You know, my, my knee hurt, but I you know, kept running through it for six months until I finally couldn't run anymore. So that's a, a psychological issue and just the nature of, of triathletes. And we're trying to educate more on the benefits of cross training. And we do a number of, you know, like the industry does, I think all the magazines like ours, our webinars, et cetera, we're focusing more and more energy on trying to get people to listen to some injury prevention tactics. Um, so we try to integrate all these insights into a process, and I won't go through this, but there's messaging in all of our retention communications addressing kind of these three core areas about you can still be a triathlete without, you know, still having a balanced life. You know, people think, I can't be a triathlete, I don't have time. Well, you do if, you know, and here's what your goal should be and here's how you could actually evolve and race even shorter distances and migrate to long distance. We also have a lot of programs that I think are important because I like to say we try to love our members as much as possible to build a more and more affinity for the overall brand of triathlon 
in our sport. Uh, we we have a quick program. I'll show you a quick clip here. of our, This is our Athlete of the Year video. We have a program at our national championships. It's really a sort of a hall of fame for the age groupers. And here's a quick clip. You know, I think it's real important that these are the opinion leaders that we try to recognize through various programs that we have, rankings and All-American. And these are the folks that are often driving the business to bring people in the sport. And, you know, unlike the pros, they're actually walking into the retailer shop and buying things. So I think it's, it's real important that, remember what I said earlier about treating these folks like Olympians. Another example is our Century Club. So we recognize triathletes that have done 100 races. And I think it really, you know, it's a small thing, but it's amazing how valuable a little commemorative patch could be on a hat or a jacket that we give out to people that have done 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 races. There's actually three people in the country that have done over 500 races, four over 400, and several over 300 races. Pretty remarkable, a lot of longevity. And these folks, obviously, it's the key identity of their life. And, the reason this is important is, let's say if you were at 87 races and you're thinking, you know, I'm going to retire, it's enough. You're not. You're going to keep racing just so you can get that century and be on our website, be a little recognition, and we show you a little bit of love that way. We're launching it out to the Race Director Club here we're going to launch as well because I think it's important that we recognize our race directors have done at least 100 races as driving the industry forward. We run a lot of promotions with some of our partners, endurance films for, for videos or our, our, our fuel belt for race belts that I think allows the sponsors to drive transactions. On the back of your membership card, it was blank and I, was going, I thought it was very valuable real estate and I threw my card to meeting one day and I, I didn't get it back till I got this one, which shows all the codes on the back of your membership card, which again, it's about driving more transactions and, and making the industry as, as big as we can. Uh, we have a promotion with uh, Tri-Sports. It's been, hopefully, will be more and more successful. Here's how inexpensive USA Triathlon membership is. You know, this is $20 off with a membership purchase or renewal, so the net cost of our membership is $25. I mean, you know, people subscribe to our magazine who aren't members and they pay $36. So I think our membership is really the best deal in town. I'm not going to go into details, but we do track various promotions. I'm happy to share this data with our members and we have great open rates and we're getting better and better and more sophisticated in targeting and trialing various communication that again be happy to, to talk about if anyone's interested. So I think there was a, some conversations about you know what our retention is and, and I think in some, some calls with various um, uh, committees etc it was we were quoted at 50 percent and this was a 2011 that 55 percent number uh, but we actually had a pretty good uptick in 2012 to 64%. So we've actually increased our retention rate 12%. And again, you know, I think, again, it keeps people vested in our sport. They become members. They feel belong to the community. There's more affinity. We certainly also want to understand, you know, all the different types of triathletes. And I think it's important that we all market with more relevance involved because we have new folks we have the folks that might ski in the winter, might go rock climbing, mountain bike, do a mud run, and might race a couple times. We have those that we deem very avid that are competing for podium and ranking. And we've segmented that in various ways, and we're trying to, to give specific relevance. So if you're a, you know, a high-end bike, we're going to market that bike to our more avid customers and a lower-end package differently so that, again, our open rates are higher and people continue to want to listen to us and there's a real strong value exchange. The more we know about the member, the more value we can provide. And I think we knew who our members are. We know what they do, race long, short, do, try. 
But now we're really trying to understand the why, which is really the next level of segmentation. And we know that people have gone through life transformations. We know they're really racing because you know, it's part of their healthy lifestyle. Uh, it's the fabric of their social life. Or they just want to keep the competitive juices flowing. And I know that many of you probably go in and out of these various passion drivers and over-index some, under-index others, and have various weightings as you evolve through your triathlon career. But we're trying to sort of leverage these passion drivers in order to continue to drive more business. We have a new member letter that used to be one member letter that went out to everybody. Now there's seven versions, men, women, youth, and, and various degrees of how avid you are as a triathlete that goes out when you renew your membership. You know, the important thing is, and I was having a conversation um, last night, is we're, we're, all, we're all part of the same community. And I think it's sort of, you know, I asked Gail Bernhardt what her first concert was. And do you remember that concert and that emotion? And then I asked, like, when was your first triathlon? And do you remember that emotion? So it's a very powerful thing. And I think I would encourage everybody to tell that story when you're talking to partners or sponsors, because it's something that's very unique about finishing your first triathlon. And this is, you want to make this a key part of your life. And we all share that community. And we're trying as best as we can to listen to our members to learn more about their passion drivers. And I want to play this clip now. Is everybody ready for a Zoomathon? Oh, I bet you are. I can't even wait. Oh, all across the room. Hey, Laura, how did you feel up for this race? Uh, you know, there's a lot of chocolate ice cream, <laughs> whipped cream, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Where can I get some? Uh, you know, you just get it anywhere, um, you know, 7-Eleven. Hey, DJ, just go ahead and mix it up. Just, just hit that. Hit that beat. Oh, yeah, that's going to be great. Hit that beat. Okay, I got these great water wings. I can't believe how well they work. I mean, a guy just got them at a garage sale. My mom said they'd work great. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, uh, you know, I'm wiry, really. I feel like I'm going to puke, but I'm going to smile anyways. Hello! Dustin, how do you keep your mustache looking so great? And, you know, I comb it up and down every day, and, you know, it's just really great. Stash. The ladies really love my stash. I mean, look at this thing. Do you hear my voice? Oh my gosh, I love squash. Stand up and raise the roof! Chopsticks are way better than a fork. It's about the way your clothes fit, too, you know? It's the hair, isn't it? <laughs> Everybody loves my hair. Do I look like a Chipotle burrito to you? We have this award. It's an orange peanut. It's really great. The recipient's backstage. An orange peanut mm -hmm. for me? Wow, an orange peanut. Well, I accept you. So we're trying to listen as much as we can. Um, and then lastly, to grow our membership is really talking about our value proposition and I won't go into all these details of, of what we provide to our members, but you know, even if I hear from members, gee, you guys provide us a lot. We say, great, well, how, how can we do better? So you know, we continue to try to evolve and amplify what we provide and keep everybody fully vested in our sport. And this is our savings calculator. And we know that, you know, I think this is all the number that triathletes spend an average of, somebody said 4,000 bucks in, in our sport a year. And if they just use you know, a reasonable number of our, where our programs are to our partners, there's a pretty good return, you know, $400, $500 savings, and a pretty good return on your investment. And I think that's important because, remember, triathletes think it's, they feel it's, they gotta, everybody has some ceiling on their disposable income. And they've got to make a decision, you know, do I spend more on the triathlon, my triathlon hobby, are on something else. And uh, we want to try to share with them that actually they can be too pretty good in investing not only on an economic term, but obviously on a health benefit and a lifestyle benefit by continuing to stay vested and in investing in our sport. Okay, the, um, another key goal obviously is, is, uh, is revenue. And you know, I, I think that um, you know, it's real important because we've run about 80 programs at USA Triathlon, and the more resources and more revenue that we have, the more we can drive the business. Uh, we're launching a foundation 
to really create funding opportunities for areas that wouldn't otherwise be funded. And we want to increase the overall brand value of the sport. Now, is revenue, I call, is, this, is this the right goal? I think some people say, gee, you know, USA Triathlon, they, you know, they, they charge us a, a, a small sanctioning fee for race directors, and it costs money to be certified, and they're making all this money. Well, we don't make any money on our programs for coaching or race director certification or um, uh, officials. It's our, the whole membership drives the business. And, you know, the more revenue that we have, and this is, I won't go through the details here, I really believe that the more the sport's going to grow. So I certainly feel that um, this virtuous cycle, you know, the more we can invest in the sport and the more we'll have ultimately more sponsors, more members, et cetera. And I think this virtuous cycle is what will drive the entire industry forward. Mainstream media. You know, we, uh, we talk a lot about saying our sport is mainstream. But yeah, this is fairly proactive by us. So we're out there trying to solicit stories in the media. And the more, oh, the Ad Age story was fantastic and some of the other media, it really starts to show you can move the meter. Um, value, you know, I think this is really about how do we make this industry that was a, a scrappy, entrepreneurial-driven industry more professional? Can we provide time-saving resources driving more efficiency and the ability to engage consumers more deeply. Um, break it down by looking at core constituency groups and how do we drive value to each one of these groups. I'll go through each one of these pretty briefly. For our members, uh, this year we're launching an entirely new membership portal. It actually wasn't, unfortunately, it wasn't that easy to be a USA Triathlon member. Uh, our database was, uh, entry point was, had some problems. And then, as I talked about, the ability to target that segmentation, the more members tell us about them, the more we can help them. So a little bit of help us help you there. Um, more and more sponsor discounts, and so we can drive more transactions to the industry. We're doing a, a lot at registration that you'll see rolling out with the ability to uh, provide convenience and upsell members on various platforms, whether it's you know, renting a wetsuit or renting disc wheels or uh, getting a coach at the point of that registration, which is when they have that emotional commitment to race. So we think it's a very, very key point for the industry. Um, more offerings. I talked about you know, people who are injured or don't want to swim, bike, or run can still be involved in multi-sports. Race directors, we're, we rolled out a brand new sanctioning portal last year. We're in development on what we call sanctioning 2.0 to improve it, make it even more efficient, more streamlined. Uh, we've started real-time validation at the point of registration, which creates convenience for members, for race directors, so that there's no longer um, you know, cash at packet pickup, so there's no should be any lines as more. Again, we want to make the experience better and hassle-free for race directors, members, everybody involved in the race day experience. Um, we've launched a program to convert one days. Some of you may have participated in this where we actually uh, vest race directors who help us uh, send a letter out to folks that did a one day. Hey, do you want to parlay your one day fee into a membership? And here's how you do it. Here's all the benefits with membership. So we've been pretty successful in rolling that out over the last, uh, last race year. And we continue to, you know, obviously uh, risk mitigation is important. There was a uh, panel yesterday, there's a talk coming up, and it's clearly something that uh, we, uh, we hope we continue to try to anticipate uh, trends in the future. For the clubs, again, this is a, a key fabric. We try to provide as many services that we can and help and support, whether uh, uh, we're rolling out a program for clubs that we can manage their websites if they'd like. Um, we run a national club championship. We're providing a guide. We're doing a summit here in San Diego on, a, on Friday, April 19th. Sponsors. So all the database work we're doing, we're now able to take and show our sponsors, here's what our database looks like. You know, here's how many, you know, redhead, 38-year-old uh, triathletes who live in West Virginia who uh, drive a saw bar. And so we have that kind of data it's very, very important to be able to target that so that our sponsors get a higher return on leveraging our database. 
Um, account management, I tell our team we want to be agency level tools. I came from that side of the business. So we focus a lot on designing programs for our sponsors. It's really hard to measure direct return on investment. So we really focus a lot on return on objectives and try to quantify what those objectives are up front and then build a sponsorship program that we can measure after the fact on our success. Um, and then drive more sales, insights, you know, cross-marketing is, uh, we'll have a sponsor summit later in August. And so hopefully folks that are in our industry can all find ways to, uh, to partner together. Okay, our lead athletes, uh, I will talk about, uh, we're going to drive a uh, investment in the super sprint space. And I'll talk more about that, but quickly that's gonna, the real goal there is not only to provide an opportunity for our elites to race uh, in that format, which is you know, a couple hundred meter swim, you know, three to five K, three to five mile bike, one mile run, laps, heats. It's to make it more visual and make it better for television. And the extent that we can put this type of series on television, again, that virtuous cycle, the more people will see it, the more mainstream it can be, the more sponsors, et cetera. We're creating squads for our elite athletes to train in team environments, whether they're in Europe or whether they're in Australia. Uh, we're investing in coaching. We're gonna publish a money list like the ATP or PGA Tour. And the reason why this is important, again, I'll come back to my virtuous cycle. I mean, the better we do on the international stage, you know, again, the more mainstream media, the more sponsorship, the more people are inspired, the more members we have. It's good for everybody as we enhance our performance around the world and leading up to, uh, to Rio in 2016. Regions, USAT has 10 regions. Each region has a regional championship. We're hoping to upgrade that race. Um, uh, these are really the arms and legs. We can't do everything from the head office in Colorado Springs. So we have a lot of active volunteers that serve as a laboratory for various programs as well as to help us uh, execute and drive things such as youth programs. Uh, each, I mentioned the uh, retro series and, and the splash and dash, and those are largely uh, executed out in the regions. Officials, we want to have more officials at our races. The more officials we have, the more everyone has a fair and potentially safer race day experience. So we provided some increased stipends for this year, uh, as well as certifying more officials so they're more available throughout the country. Donors, we haven't uh, had a foundation. You know, what, yes, we're a nonprofit, but there really wasn't a platform for those that want to donate to our sport to engage, and we've uh, established that with a separate 501c3 this year. Uh, Paratriathlon, um, you know, we were voted into the uh, Paralympics for 2016. We have a uh, pretty robust program. We have some dedicated staff. We're engaging heavily with, uh, with the military, I would say, Unfortunately for us as a country, but you know, maybe fortunately for us as USA Paratriathlon, we have a fair amount of you know, ex-military injured vets that are uh, coming into our program now. Uh, we provide them with the experience similar to our able-bodied athletes and the ability and a pathway to, uh, to race on the world stages. Uh, we're starting even a youth bid, and we've been pretty successful thus far. Youth, uh, I mentioned this earlier. Um, the key one there is uh, we did a splash and dash series, which was 30 races last year and 40 races this year. And that's really to draw largely first time kids in an aquathlon first to keep it very, very simple and then as a gateway to triathlon. And the last one, we're spending some time and looking at various access points in the school programs. The last key goal for us is, is performance. And this is beyond podiums. This is operationally, I think, uh, you know, I come from a, been an officer in a public company for my former life. And, you know, I, I think that it's important that we be disciplined. You know, I, I think there's a it's, a, it's a falsehood that nonprofits don't have discipline. I think the good are, are run with a lot of metrics and discipline. And that's how we try to run and compare ourselves against benchmarks. Uh, from an operational standpoint, are we being as efficient as we can be? Are we allocating our resources appropriately? These type of questions that are, that are asked daily in our office. Um, here's an example. This is our goals for the, the high performance program. This is on the elite ITU racing series. And we clearly want uh, we specific goals to measure ourselves against this performance. 
and this is on the highest level of racing, and, and we have a whole robust high performance plan and, and how we get there. Some of the key wins. Uh, I mentioned our Splash and Dash series, and maybe some of you have seen this or in your neighborhood, but we went out and started a brand new, I shouldn't, it's not a series, in fact, the kids go from one race to the other. We just put a, a slight subsidy out there to race directors. We had a goal to do 30 in 2012. Uh, these are you know, generally not timed, very simple, down and dirty, but we want a safe experience. We wanted to um, just expose kids to our sport. We wanted to have it geographically across the country, and uh, I think we were pretty successful. We had 24 new kid events out of the 30. Over half were female, and we're doing 40 this year. Our medical report that we took this initiative uh, to heart. You know, we've had a, a number of fatalities over the last two years that potentially could impact uh, our entire industry. So we convened, we think, the world's experts, at least in this country, in terms of the cause of this. And, and I want to say a couple things about this. You know, we, we get focused on this because, uh, you know, a couple deaths in New York and, and, and a lot of the media sensationalism happened. And we had a, a relatively high number of deaths, not high number from a percentage of overall people that raced, just a high number of the, of the prior, of the previous years. But, you know, there's roughly 4,300 sudden sports cardiac deaths a year. And if you ask your friends who are, know nothing about triathlon and say, you know, there's over 4,000 races, there's you know, roughly, you know, 4,300 people that have a sudden cardiac death while doing a sport, and you say, gee, you know, you know, you know, our average age is we have a lot of athletes in the 50, 60, 70, even 80 year old category. How many people think would die in a triathlon in a year? And I ask this question, you'll go, oh, I don't know, 275, I don't know, 300, 400, I mean, 10% of all deaths. And obviously it's much, much less than that. So keep it in perspective. We do so much more to prolong life, to improve the quality of life. And, you know, having uh, gone through this myself and dealing with families, uh, members uh, for our race in Vermont, and if any of you saw Bill Burke's presentation in Colorado Springs, where he's been through, I think, eight fatalities over his uh, you know, 20, 25 year career, you know, you, you keep coming back, because you know in the balance, you know, we're doing our share of improving the health in this country. You know, we're the world's most uh, overweight country, and we have more 21st century metabolic disease than any other country in the world, and, and we're doing our part to really transform lives here. But going back to this study, it was very important because we came to this notion of shared responsibility between us as the governing body. You know, do we have the right techniques for spotting in the water? Do we ch are challenging ourselves? Are our responders in the right place? Is our communication in the right place? Are we doing the right in terms of pre-race? Are, are we doing everything we can? Because we can change anything that we're doing that'll save one life, we will do it. I mean, safety is a paramount focus at USA Triathlon. Other shared responsibility is obviously the participant. You know, some common sense. You hear anecdotal stories of someone that had, you know, chest pain or shoulder pain, and oh, I'm going to race anyway, and I oh, really didn't belong in that, that body of water. And, you know, taking responsibility is fairly commonsensical. And third is the race director. So this, pub, this study is on our website. Uh, we're not stopping here. This is just the beginning. Uh, Dr. Larry Creswell is uh, fantastic. He's heading this for us. He's, He'll answer emails, um, and you can find his content information on our website. Mentioning our website, I think this is um, becoming the standard bear now in the national governing body space. We have a number of personalizations, so when you log in, you know who you are, know when you raced, and we're running 24 different scenarios uh, off of our website, and so much so that the uh, USOC and other folks have started to actually retain us to help them design similar functionality for their websites. I mentioned paratriathlon. I think this is really key for us because um, right now we're winning about a third of the medals at world championships. And so what does that mean to everybody in the room? Well, it's, first of all, I think it's fantastic that we win 34% of the medals in Auckland, New Zealand, but it helps to draw uh, more exposure and interest uh, for our sport and inspire a lot of folks. So these paratriathletes are, are fantastic and we hope to, you know, maintain that hold on the world. The rest of the world has heavy government money investing in this. And I would encourage uh, those of you to want to get involved with the USA Paratriathlon, we'd love to have that conversation. 
Our social media, again, this is, we know, we saw, you know, 74% of our members are engaging by Facebook. So we continue to drive the Facebook and the Twizzfeer and all the other new applications that are coming out. Um, you know, our unique visitors to our website are probably gonna be two, two and a half million this year, which is, which is a pretty respectable number uh, for a governing body website. We had the race uh, in San Diego, we think is important for the uh, entire industry. You know, it, um, Served as our Olympic qualifier. Um, we, uh, it was broadcast uh, around the world. And we're coming back here in, uh, in April for the uh, second version of the, of the highest level of World Championship Series uh, racing. We think that is a lot to, to generate overall exposure for the sport. There's a couple of highlights. So it's just uh, you know, down the road at the beach at Mission Beach. Uh, if you're uh, in town, I'd certainly welcome, uh, welcome you to attend. And that was obviously, we talked about that last night. That was uh, when Manny hurt the qualifier. There's another look at that shot. Quite, a, quite an emotional day for, I think, uh, everybody in triathlon. You know, that was, again, the first race in the U.S. in, in three years. Um, you know, we had uh, over a couple thousand age groupers from 42 states. And, I, and again, I think it's important to, to race at this quality is, you know, get everybody more and more uh, engaged and, and excited about being a part of it. Some of our key initiatives going forward. I, I mentioned the, the foundation. Um, you know, this is really going to be a charitable arm. And again, it's provide opportunities we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. Um, we're certainly hoping to enhance the entire triathlon goodwill. Um, and, and we don't know that much about fundraising because we fortunately haven't had to do it. Uh, but we're learning. And the foundation is going to drive investments in youth, in particular, youth in underserved communities in paratriathlon elite development, because I think all three of these are important for the overall growth of the market. Uh, I talked about our membership portal. Um, you know, within a couple of months, our members will be engaged with us in a much more streamlined fashion. Uh, and again, that, let's say the value of exchange, meaning you know, we'll be able to provide them with more relevant information as we built in the segmentation into our new membership portal. Uh, we continue to uh, look for more and more insights, knowing more and more about our members. Uh, our race calendar, we're, we're, we're investing fairly significantly to improve this function. And I know there are other you know, websites that, that, that have calendars here. But here we're going to have a calendar. It's going to designate if you know, you're a certified race director, sanctioned race. Uh, reviews will be available on a simple uh, star system. And you know, our calendar uh, only put up races that after you sanction, now we're doing it as pending sanction. So we're, this calendar was, is not very large in terms of capturing races. So we want to capture a much, much, much bigger share of the market and make that uh, linking back. There's web links to your individual race. And so we hope to have that uh, up and running in the next several weeks. This is also an interesting new initiative for us because um, you know, when we try to find results, uh, it's hard. You know, it's, there's all different formats. There's a couple of databases that do it. I don't really think it's uh, sufficiently aggregated. Uh, I can't go back and find results from 20 years ago. So when I say time capsule, we want to be the repository of our results, which we should be able to do in the sense that we get the results anyway for our rankings, but have them in a searchable format. So I can go look at anybody's race and see how they did in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, we have this um, in beta mode right now. It's a, it's a fun tool for those who are interested, either your own or people that you know, or be able to see your improvement or, or how you, you know, what was my 10K time for that race 17 years ago? All that's going to be here in 17 years. So I think this is a real, real important initiative, and I think that will uh, be a service to the, to the entire industry as we sort of create this warehouse of results uh, for, for every race in the country. I mentioned the Super Sprint Series, and, and I think it's uh, uh, important because when I showed the, the, the moment video earlier, you know, this is really going to be pretty compelling television. And we're, you know, in investing in this, you can't make an economic return because entry fees are essentially non-existent. But we're talking portable pools uh, in stadiums. And being able to see an entire race where the bike course may be 200 meters down, all out, a 180-degree turn, and 200 meters out, 
down in front of a crowd, in front of a stadium. And it gives a great experience for our development elite athletes to have a you know, real fast and furious, high-end race experience. And visually, you know, much more interesting. You know, the, the biking is tight. You know, there might be one or two more crashes, um, which we're not promoting, but it's just certainly something that we're creating that the physicality of the event and the violence of the effort will be more evident right in front of your eyes. And to the extent we can be successful, this has been done in Australia, it's been done in France, there's been a couple of pockets that were done here in San Diego. But we're setting up a trial series uh, for three races this year. There's a photo from uh, a setup that was in Australia. Sometimes, you know, this will picture more, ours will be more portable pools uh, in, a, in, a, in a place where we can put a lot of spectators that can see the entire course. And frankly, it's very expensive to televise a triathlon on a 40K course and getting that signal and you've got helicopters and planes and motorcycles and a bunch of cameras. So we're designing it so that it, frankly, we can afford to have it televised. So we're, in, uh, we're putting the, the final details on this, this programming that we hope, again, will draw more interest to the overall industry. Keys to the future. Um, I keep talking about spectators. I think it's very, very key. We know how hard it is to engage the non-endemic space, and I think that will be a game changer to the extent we can, between various initiatives to draw more, I call fandom, more affinity for watching triathlon. Uh, the social energy, I'll talk about spectators. You know, more broadcast. Uh, I've talked about a reality show for the last year or so, and I've received a number of proposals, and we're, we're talking about one right now. I hope the extent is, that, you know, triathletes that we think are in our industry are pretty in interesting, you know, they're interesting to the mainstream and we're trying to find ways to, to make that the case so that we can again draw more and more people that kind of have a, uh, they maybe have seen the Ironman once or twice or know a triathlete, but they really don't. It's not destination television. And the extent that we can get destination television where people want to watch this stuff or DVR it, then I think uh, it will, will be a game changer. Um, you know, the, I remember, anyone remembers the This Week in Running show, or Running and Racing show with Mario LaCorey and we were looking to develop a a show on that model, which uh, is probably more of an initially an online show that will be this week, uh, this week in triathlon. And I know the competitor and others do some of that already, and we'd be happy to partner uh, with anybody in the industry. Social energy, and, and I, what I mean by that is looking at the amazing success of the color run and mud run business. I think they really have done a great job of capturing that. And, you know, again, you know, we're doing that with, in the club environment where when clubs show up, you know, they might show up with 300 people at your race. And if you can engage them and capture that socially, um, I think that's really key. And having a more team orientation, particularly on the kids' side, because they want to go to, remember, soccer practice, basketball practice, and triathlon practice. I think it's a key driver in the growth on the, on the youth side. And more and more on the corporate side as well, we're engaging those that will take up entire you know, waves at events. Uh, just about done here. Diversity is, uh, is real important. Remember, this is what we look like. This is what the US looked like a couple years ago. And you know, we're not anywhere as nearly diverse if you overlay those two there and there. And you know, the facts are that Three kids, three out of five kids under five are currently members of minority groups. So, you know, if we don't change, we'll always be a niche sport because the U.S. is going to look dramatically different over the next 20 years. I think it's roughly half kids, even under 18, are now members of minority groups. And so we talk a lot about it, but if we don't really change, and I think it's really almost a cultural adaptation because there's not a lot of triathlete role models and, and we do some one-off programs and investments uh, in various programs that impact a little about, you know, but it's tough to move the meter. And so the key is to have it scalable, we really need to create an entirely new cultural paradigm shift in these communities. Because again, I think we have to really focus uh, more energy because if not, uh, you know, our, our customers in the future are, are not going to be there uh, for the growth. Okay, so if we do all these things, if we drive 
more spectators and we capture the social energy and we're successful uh, on our diversity initiative, uh, we hope this is what we're going to see in the future uh, for triathlon. And then we talked a lot about gold and, you know, how do we get there? And then I think this is certainly a, a pathway uh, for, the, for the pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob.